Hello friends, good afternoon. I am Shravan, president of Tripoli Graduate Student Club. Today I am excited to introduce our first graduate colloquium, which is organized in collaboration with Institute of Advanced Studies, NTU. Graduate colloquium will be conducted regularly on trending and hot topics in academia and industry, in which we will bring the expertise of those fields to come to NTU and explain their work and discuss their work with the graduate students. As a first topic, we have chosen machine learning and we are happy to have Professor Justin Dowell. Professor Justin got his PhD degree from Swiss Polytechn Polytechnical Institute of Technology, ETH in Zurich. He had worked at few world's best laboratories and joined NTU in 2010. Currently, he is Associate Professor Director of Neuroengineering Program in School of Tripoli. He is also a Deputy Director of ST Engineering NTU Corporate Labs. Now it's time to hand over the mic to Professor Justin. Please welcome him. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming. I know it's uh, Friday afternoon. I was expecting fewer people. Uh, just out of curiosity, how many of you are PhD students? Can you please raise your hands? So maybe about one third of you. Undergrad students? Undergraduates? Nobody. Some professors, I see. I see some lab members as well. So thank you for coming. Um, so for me, it's a pleasure to be here. Usually I have to travel all the way to Europe or, or US uh, to talk about my work. Now I can just be here and to you and share it with you guys. It's fantastic. It's like playing a home game. Yeah, it's like a home game. So um, I'll talk about, maybe you can switch off the lights so we have better contrast. I'll talk about machine learning, and uh, specifically applied to uh, transportation systems, and there specifically it will be for autonomous uh, vehicles. And I think many of you have heard of machine learning. Who has heard of machine learning? I think all of you. Who is using machine learning? Who wants to learn about machine learning? Some, and some are very enthusiastic, raise their hand all the way up, so that's great. And hopefully you will learn something from my talk. So I think many of you are reading about machine learning in the newspapers. And sometimes the, st the stories can be quite scary, uh, uh, not just about machine learning, but robots that are using machine learning and also, for instance, the machine may not take your job, but even worse, it may become your boss. Yeah? Um, or um, white collar robots are coming for jobs. And uh, robots, will, robots will destroy our jobs. We're not ready for it. So you see those stories, and I think uh, me as a professor, I have to take them very uh, critically and, and make sure actually some of it makes sense or not. We have to verify. So my, my, my talk will be a bit more critical. I think you've heard many talks saying that AI is going to take over the world, and a bit more dramatic. Let's see what AI can do, what it cannot do. So I'll be critical about AI and machine learning in, in, uh, in particular. Maybe some of you have heard of the Gartner hype cycle. Yeah, so it's uh, a graph showing how new technologies are um, absorbed in society, how they're being perceived in society. And oftentimes, if a new technology emerges, there's a lot of enthusiasm, hype. It's going to solve all the problems. It's going to bring you world peace. Everything is going to be solved by new technology. And we have had uh, IoT, we've had uh, 5G, and, and all that. So, uh, and then, so first you have the hype period. You have a peak of um, inflated expe expectations. And then gradually, people wake up, start using technology, find out, ooh, it fails. Actually, this thing crashes. Sometimes it doesn't work. So the, the expectations uh, go down. People are a bit more skeptical. Then maybe some companies are persistent. They want to bring the technology into the market. They keep improving technology. Then eventually, it might be commercialized and become a product that you use every day. So this is the hype cycle. Now guess where machine learning and deep learning is located on this graph? Right at the peak. Yeah? So that's there it is now. So I have deep learning and machine learning over there at the hype, peak of the hype. Huh? And then uh, autonomous driving now is already a bit beyond the peak. Why? As I'll show. We've had accidents. Autonomous cars start, start crashing. We had I mean, accidents in uh, Arizona, in San Francisco. 
I think people are becoming aware that it's not that easy to build an EV autonomous vehicle. Okay, so but now yeah, machine learning is still uh, all the way up there. People have very high expectations. Now, of course, those ex expectations for machine learning um, are valid. I mean, it's not like uh, there hasn't been made any progress. There has been a lot of progress. And here's an example of computer vision. In this specific case, it's a machine learning algorithm that tries to detect uh, cars, for instance, in the scene. It does a good job. It doesn't miss any cars. It does a good job at finding the cars. And the same for people. And those technologies have improved a lot over the years. Uh, if you look at uh, the following here, that's the um, classification error, uh, recognition error, excuse me, and uh, for a particular competition. And when it started, you had very high errors over time now, uh, over the last couple of years, the errors have dropped dramatically. Okay, so obviously systems are becoming more reliable. Doesn't mean that they are perfectly reliable. I will show you many cases where systems fail. Okay, but at least here's an example computer vision and specific, specifically, and detecting object, of objects where uh, progress has been made consistently year after year after year. And that's very promising. Of course, we should not be naive. So what we are doing in the lab is to figure out when does machine learning fail. OK, that's important to know. If you build an EV, autonomous vehicle, you have to know when it's going to fail. Otherwise, people will die. OK, how can we fix it? Once we know when it goes wrong, how can we fix the problem with machine learning? Okay. And then I will talk about how to use ML machine learning in the context of autonomous vehicles, how to deal with failing machine learning in autonomous vehicles, how to test safety of vehicles, and so on. That's the second part. Yeah? Then I will briefly talk about uh, future work vision for the future. And please, uh, you can stop me anytime if you have a question. Don't hesitate. So, okay, Chris, uh, what do you see here? Panda. What do you see here? The panda. Okay, great. What does Google Net see? Google Net is, a, is an object detector, one of the fancy state of the art technologies, division technique. Here it does see the panda, hooray, fantastic. Here it thinks it's a gibbon. In case you know what a gibbon is. Oops, sorry. Yeah, that's a gibbon. Okay, it's not. It doesn't quite look like a panda, maybe slightly. If from far away it looks like a panda, but it's not a panda, obviously. So how come? For us, obviously, both are pandas. Correct? Right? So what has happened? Well, some smart people uh, did a trick. They added a noise to this picture to obtain this picture. Okay. They designed the noise such that it would confuse the Google Net detector. All right, so they added noise specifically to make the detector confused such that even though we think it's a panda, the system thinks it's a gibbon. All right? So are you concerned now? You think it, ooh, that, that's really troublesome. Yeah, probably. But when I saw this the first time, I was like, OK, so what? Because in nature, this won't happen, right? You won't have a, like a heavily optimized noise vector, a noise image that you add, and then it will confuse the detector. You may think. That's what I thought. It's actually, it's actually much worse than this. This is now a kind of an academic example, but it's very easy to make computer vision systems fail. And that's what I will show. So here's an example from one of our students, uh, Liu Litao who is not here, I think, today, but he's in our, in our team. And he was uh, taking pictures, uh, actually uh, having a, a dash cam. And he uh, drove around and took pictures when it was raining. So on the pictures, you have uh, on the windshield, there are drops, uh, raindrops. And here's a, a close up. So you see a raindrop. The system thinks it's a car. Oh, when I saw that. I was really concerned, because imagine you have that uh, in your maybe autonomous vehicle. Whenever it rains, your system sees cars, the EV will stop. So you can't drive, right? That's the issue. So that's, uh, it's, yeah, you take, it's very easy to reproduce. You, you take a state-of-the-art 
uh, object detector, you show, show it such images with raindrops, it will get confused and show cars. It's big trouble, okay? But it's worse than that. So um, if you think of autonomous vehicles, I think some of you have heard of autonomous vehicles, have seen how they are built. Uh, they have to, first of all, uh, look around and perceive the world. We have eyes and ears and nose, smell. Uh, but how do cars see? Well, they have uh, cameras, of course, cameras. Uh, but more than that, they have also um, LIDARs, which use lasers. So lasers are rotated, and you re capture the reflections. And that's how you can reconstruct the 3D environment. And that leads to such pictures. Okay, so you have a nice high density map of the environment in 3D. That's very useful for autonomous vehicles to navigate themselves. Okay. Now, some companies, including Tesla, say that you can just rely on cameras. No need to incorporate LIDARs. Uh, I think Elon Musk said literally, if you use LIDAR, you're doomed. He said uh, like a few months ago in March, I think he said that. If you use LiDAR, you're doomed. Only use vision, he said. But you should know, I think, because what happened in 2016, a Tesla car crashed into a truck. It relied on vision only. The system was confused. What happened? You had the scenario where the car came from this direction. You had the white truck, and it was a bright day, very bright day, and the, the vision system couldn't pick up, couldn't see the truck. Okay, it's a well-known case, one of the first accidents with autonomous, uh, semi-autonomous cars. Okay, if it had used the lidar, probably it would have seen the truck because it would have had reflections. But by relying only on the camera, you may have accidents. That's one more example of how machine learning can fail. But there are more examples. So my student, Litao, did more, more experiments. He started with this picture he took in the parking lot. And um, he uh, then uh, started playing with it. He rotated the image over different angles. Okay, So nothing spectacular. He rotated it over uh, minus 10, 10, minus 15, 15, and showed the pictures to Inception, which is an object detection system, also deep learning, has you know, many different layers, very sophisticated. The system is completely confused, OK? It thinks it's a monitor, a school bus, a car mirror, a snow plow. Obviously, completely off, right? <laughs> it has nothing to do with car. So the system can, can be easily hacked. So maybe, okay, let me ask you a question. How come? Mm -hmm. Why do you think? Ah, okay. That's a totally different topic. Why? Uh, because uh, LiDAR is very expensive. So a LiDAR system has 64 lasers. It costs more than the vehicle itself and the car itself. I think $60,000. So from a commercial viewpoint, uh, if you want to rely on LiDAR, you might be in trouble. Unless LiDAR becomes cheaper. And now many companies and small startups, like in Israel and the US, are developing uh, small scale, much more compact uh, ladder systems, which are cheaper. Instead of 60,000, maybe they cost $1,000. Then ladder would be much more viable. Um, from a technological viewpoint, as I've shown, it's kind of irresponsible, I would say, not to rely on ladder, to only rely on vision for autonomous, fully autonomous driving. As you've seen in the example of the, after the accident. Quick question. The radar is rotating constantly. You have 64 um, lasers on top of each other. Radar is also in the system. So radar is often available, uh, is, is, sorry, is inside the uh, perception system. I, I haven't touched upon that, but um, yeah, radar sensors are there often as well. But LiDAR provides the most information. It's very high density. Now also radar systems are becoming better. You can have high resolution radar for autonomous vehicles, which are not being deployed. So maybe over time, radar may overtake uh, LiDAR. It depends on the price point. One of the issues is price point.
Potentially, yes. These are very different uh, physical principles. LiDAR rela relies on uh, LiDAR relies on light, laser. Radar on EM waves. Very different. Okay. Can I move? <laughs> Thank you. So, if you rotate images, the system is confused. Any idea why? Do we know something about machine learning? What is wrong? Ah, I don't know. Who said that? Can you raise your hand? Very good. We should, we should give you an ice cream after. Thank you. <laughs> Organizes by now his name. Um, okay, very good. Of course, the car, the car, but Inception, as I will show you, had never seen rotated cars. It doesn't know. It has never seen that. Okay, and that we, we verified ourselves. So, uh, Inception is trained on a. You know, before I move on, of course, you may say, well, Cars are never rotated, they're always straight. I guess some of you have been to San Francisco. We have hills in the city, the cars go up and down. And maybe if you like rally, driving in the under off-road conditions, the car will wobble. And so the car sometimes can be in different positions, right? Obviously. So it's not like a highly contrived case. It, it can be relevant for practical purposes. Now, Inception is trained on a very well known data set called ImageNet. ImageNet has a whole bunch of images. And then my student, Litao, he checked whether um, it has any rotated cars. So he picked out all the images with cars. He computed the angle. OK. Then he made a histogram of the different angles. Lo and behold, the majority of cases uh, have, a, have an angle of 0 or maybe 2 or 3 degrees. Hardly any pictures or images have an angle beyond uh, 10 degrees. So that's the training set. Most images of cars have straight cars, vertical cars. Few of them are tilted. So the system is fed with straight cars. Doesn't, it, it, has, it hasn't seen tilted cars. Okay? That's why when you show a tilted car, it's confused. Uh, so thank you. That's the point. And we show it here. So beyond 10 degrees, the detection probability drops dramatically. That kind of corresponds to this histogram. Beyond 10 degrees, you have very few examples. Okay, so maybe I ask you the same question. Maybe you can have a second ice cream. Um, <laughs> how would you solve a problem? How do you solve a problem? Excuse me. From life. Okay, so life. Uh, that's a good idea, but it's expensive. You would have to go out, take pictures. You have a cheaper option. Yeah, so one idea is to take your existing image and rotate. Yeah, so that's what I did. So I took, uh, every talk should have a picture with a cat. <laughs> so I took uh, my favorite picture. Uh, so we rotate the cat over different angles and also crop it. And uh, <coughs> that we fed into the system. It's possible. But in practice, you may have different rotations or different sorry, transformations, not just rotations. If you think of driving around in Singapore, and uh, yeah, the scenes might be quite complicated. You wouldn't just see rotated or tilted objects. Maybe you have occlusion, it may rain, uh, you may have dust. So you have many possible transformations. If you have to create new data sets for every possible transformation that you may encounter in the future, that would be very cumbersome. That's the first issue. Second issue. If I use such rotated images, does the system become smarter? Is it really intelligent? So if I show it this image after training, OK, I show this image, it will still say it's a cat. Yeah, it's not just a cat. It's actually a cat that has been rotated by a particular angle. The system wouldn't know. Okay, the system doesn't have any sense of rotations in itself. It just has learned that, okay, that's a cat, and that's a cat, and that's a cat, and that's a cat. But it doesn't internally represent rotations. So it's still equally dumb as before. It's more robust against rotations, but it hasn't learned much about the universe. Okay. So it's definitely possible to augment your data, in this case with rotations, rotated images, but it does not make the system smarter. And instead, uh, what we propose and not just us, but also other teams, that is to teach the system that in the world, things can be 
rotate it. So we take the existing neural network and we augment the system with physical variables, angles, for instance, that encode rotations, or scaling parameters that encode scaling and skew parameters. So we encode in the system physical variables. So the system knows that, yeah, you can have all kinds of rotations in the physical world. So it becomes actually a bit smarter. That's the idea. It helps a lot, and I will show that. So yeah, so in that case, <coughs> excuse me, um, once you have that model, as I'll show, you can sample from the model. I get uh, different digits, uh, but then for different angles. So automatically, it will show you digits for under different angles. So it knows that this can happen. Rotations can happen. Okay. So you can have rotations. You can also encode, for instance, uh, scaling. There we show we show different uh, digits, uh, digits at different scales. So that's also encoded in the system. And uh, specifically, what we encode is uh, our affine transformations. Maybe some of you have heard about matrices and use matrices uh, in, in your work. Um, so we encode skew and rotation and zoom taken together. That leads to affine transformations, affine matrices. And that's in the system. So the system can compute these parameters for a given object. So now it knows more. It knows that, OK, we have a cat. That's a scaling parameter. Have, there's some skew. That's the angle. So it can actually explain what's in the scene, as opposed to saying, ah, it's a cat, and then silence. Okay? By incorporating such parameters, the system becomes much more robust, because we're teaching it about possible things happening in the world. And maybe that's a bit uh, more philosophical. Maybe some of you are working on uh, signal processing, maybe radar, signal processing or communication systems. And uh, in this context, what you have is a model with uh, parameters. And these parameters are often uh, well known. They are physical variables. Like think of radar. You have uh, time of arrival as a, as a variable. You have maybe the, the pulse width and the pulse magnitude. These are well known physical variables that we, as engineers, design. So we know what, what are the important physical variables. We call them here theta. The model itself, we also know. If you think about radar, we can have the Maxwell equations. We know how the waves propagate and all that. So we can actually write down the whole model by ourselves. It's fully specified. It might be ugly. It might be very complicated. We have 20, 30 different physical variables, no linearities. At least you can write down on paper. Okay? That's one world. I actually come from this world. That's what I did when I was younger. Okay? If we had a very cool model. We could specify everything. We could inf infer all the parameters. However, then we have a different world. Machine learning, okay? Very different world. There, you have uh, very little is known. The model is just a function that is very flexible. It can capture, it can describe many different things, like digits and maybe faces and cats and dogs. So it can model many different things. But it's hard to specify on paper. You need to have a flexible model, uh, P, which depends on the uh, weights. You may have millions of weights, if not hundreds of millions of weights. So three parameters, basically you're fitting a function. Okay, that's the idea. You're fitting a function. You can't explain what the 50 parameter means or the 275th parameter means. You don't know what it means. You don't know, but you just fit the function. These are very different worlds. Am I clear? You have the world of signal processing where the model is very clear, parameters have a physical meaning, and all that. That's a whole different community in the uh, acad acad academia and in industry. Then you have a totally different community dealing with such huge models with many parameters. Okay? These models don't have any physical variables. Okay? They just fit things, fit parameters. They don't explain what's happening, per se. What we're trying to do is merge the two, augment these models with some physical variables, as we just explained to you. Okay? Can be rotations, can be different scaling parameters. So we mix the two, and uh, here is how we would describe it. So you have a model P, now in purple. So some parts are unknown, or flexible. Some parts have physical meaning. And you have parameters, like the angles, and, and skew, and so on. And still you have weights. So the weights, if you think about digits, the weights would describe how a 1 looks like, or 2, written, handwritten 2 looks like, or 3 looks like. And the theta parameters describe the angles, and so on. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yes, so for instance, if you build a machine, uh, um, a machine learning system, perception system for autonomous cars, the cars drive in the world, say in Singapore, you know what to expect. You know how the lanes look like, you know what the traffic lights and signs look like, so we know a lot of, uh, we have prior knowledge, which we can use to, uh, yeah, which we can incorporate in the system to make it more robust. That's the idea. Yeah, that's the usual machine learning approach. You have a black box, you feed in data, and hopefully something meaningful will come out of it. We try to make it a bit grayer. Not fully black, we add some knowledge, some physically meaning, meaningful uh, variables in the system. Okay? So P is the model, and I made it purple because it's like a mix of blue and red. And some parts of the model are flexible, have, have many parameters, weights, I should say. And some parts have the physical variables have a very clear meaning, like the affine transformations. Okay, and that allows us, as I said, to then uh, create a model where you can simulate rotated uh, digits of different shapes. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so it's a mix of signal processing and machine learning that makes the machine learning models more robust. So here's a different thing. So how, how would you then train such a model? Uh, that's a very hot topic now, machine learning, called uh, generative adversarial networks. Who has heard of that? I guess some of you, only a few, yeah. I'll try to explain it, it's a bit complicated. So how do we train such a model? Well, we have actually two systems, two neural networks, which are competing, okay? So one acts like a counterfeiter, okay? Bad guy, counterfeiter. The other network, acts like a police officer. Okay. The counterfeiter, also called generator, tries to create new data, synthetic data, that looks like the original data. Okay. So it tries to create new data that looks like the original data. Think of digits, but to try to create new digits that look like a one or a two or a three, but it's new. It's not from the original data set. It's a new, um, yeah, a new digit, for example. Imagine you have a database of uh, pictures of uh, rooms in a house, okay? If you have one million such pictures of different rooms, and then this generator will try to create a new room, a new picture of a room. Maybe even mixing different aspects of all the rooms in a database, okay? The police officer will check, so, oh, sorry, the generator shows either an actual sample of the data set, a true one, or a synthetic example that it created itself, okay? So either it's a true, sample from the database or synthetic, okay? And the police officer will have to tell which ones are from the actual database, which ones are fake, synthetic, okay? So why, what, what's going on? Why do we care? Well, the two are competing. Over time, the police officer gets better and better at telling or differentiating what is an actual sample, what is synthetic. And over time, he becomes better and better, or he or she becomes better and better at uh, creating fake data. It looks like the actual data set. By doing so, this generator has learned how data looks like. Essentially, it's becoming a model of your data set. Okay? So if, you, if it keeps on going, if it keeps going on, it creates synthetic digits. So it knows how a digit looks like over time. Is it more or less clear? It's not an easy concept. It's a, it was actually revolutionary. It was proposed in 2014. It's a very new way to train such models. So you have competition between the generator, which creates synthetic data, which looks like the actual data, and then this discriminator, which tells which examples are fake, which ones are synthetic, which ones are uh, real from the actual data set. Is it more or less clear? Okay, I hope it is. Okay. It's not easy, I agree with you. But it's, uh, so the mathematical principle is, uh, it's actually kind of a, it's a game, so it's based on game theory. And so um, uh, that's the technical um, diagram, if you will. So you have um, one system, one neural network that acts like the generator, the counterfeiter, one which acts like a discriminator, which will tell which samples are real from the training set, which ones are fake. Okay. And that whole system is trained following this uh, optimization objective function. Now, this objective function is a measure of how often uh, the discriminator is correct. 
So he, this system will try to maximize it, so you have max, but uh, the counterfeiter will try to confuse the discriminator, so you have a minimum. So it's a min-max problem, it's a, it's a well-known problem in game theory. Okay? If you have two competing entities, then it automatically corresponds to a min-max problem. I guess it's a bit too complicated, but if you want to know more, of course, follow the, the reference. Now, what we did is we extended this concept by incorporating the physical variables that I've discussed before, the affine transformations. So as we generate uh, examples, new examples, we actually rotate them, scale them, skew them. The same here for the, so we also apply the same to the training set, and then the discriminator has to tell the difference, and also infers the different parameters. So we augment the GAN approach, we incorporate the physical variables in the system, and also the objective function has those parameters um, inside. Yeah, I won't go into more, into more detail. The thing is that we start from a plain machine learning formulation and we inject the physical variables. So we get a kind of a mixed uh, system. All right. So, okay. Um, have a drink. Any questions? I'm still awake. Sure. I yeah, know it's a bit tricky one. Uh, the thing is, like, it could be a Gaussian distribution, it could be uh, uniform between zero and one, each pixel. It's to control. If you want to generate uh, new, uh, if you want to generate fake images, so you have to start from some random seed, it's like a random seed. So you sample, so this could be uh, a Gaussian, it could be Gaussian noise, and it goes to the system here, generator, which then produces the fake image. So each time you sample random noise, it will create a new fake image. Yeah, that you have to specify yourself. Um, it actually doesn't matter that much because it uh, learns over time how to create fake images from this random vector. So if you take a uh, Gaussian, it's okay, I guess. If it's a uniform distribution between zero and one for each pixel, it will learn over time how to transform that through all those layers into a fake image. Because it's, it tunes the weights in those boxes uh, to look that for, for, to, to create outputs which look like uh, images in a training set. And so basically it's a non-linear transformation which transforms this noisy input into this image. And that will depend, of course, on the noise, the type of noise that you apply at the input. Okay, yes. Yes. Uh, what I mean by gentleman is that it has to be part of a training set. So it's not part of the training set, but definition is not genuine. So in other words, in real life, how do you use genuine? In real life? <laughs> That's a different question. Uh, I guess you have a mark, no? You have you have to look at the mark inside the note, bank note. Yes. Yeah, it should be okay, no? Because each note, typically the bank notes have uh, markers. So you can, that's not uh, an issue, I think. More questions? I saw one more person. Yes, Panda. Uh, noise was optimized maybe by a different system, doesn't have to be a GAN. Could have been done as well. Um, 
but in the adversarial attacks, the noise is not purely random, it's heavily optimized. So probably it's unlikely to hit such an example. Yeah, so the adversarial attacks are optimized by people or by systems. Here the aim is to create a model of data. So the counterfeiter, if the counterfeiter knows how to create fake banknotes, well, he or she knows how banknotes look like, right? Because he can make fake banknotes which look like real ones, so he has figured out, he or she has figured out how they look like. Even an expert cannot tell the difference. So he can make those banknotes and the same is true. So if you have a system which creates pictures of, of rooms, rooms in Singapore and houses, apartments and all that, uh, you can't tell the difference. Obviously the system knows exactly how rooms typically look like. It's, yeah, it has learned that. So it's a very good model of such data sets. I hope I'm, I'm more or less clear. Uh, but there are, the point is that there are different ways of training the system. Yes. That's a great question. Um, yes, but there might be many, many different takes, but the, the thing is not, you can say, it should be able to tell whether it's a true one or not. Is it true? Yeah, the, the fake space is huge. The true space might be, might be small, right? So it says, okay, it's not true. It's not the actual case, so it's fake. Uh, but I don't know how fake it is, but it, 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 had, it has a model for true cases, so you can tell it's not a true case. It doesn't make sense. The fake space might be huge. You may have all kinds of uh, fake uh, um, samples. I guess uh, you stop when the training error converges. And you keep sampling, sampling, sampling uh, noise vectors, and the noise till it converges. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, I know, of course, but uh, how do you know whether you have covered all possible fake cases? It's hard to say. Yeah, but it depends on the loss function, right? It depends on the loss function if you have a different loss function. It depends on the loss function, so the loss function is critical. And this question was more general, I think. Yeah. Okay, so uh, before, let, let's uh, move on. Um, so. But I'll show you now our results. So this is the result, the performance of a regular vanilla uh, convolutional neural network, CNN, applied to rotated images, in this case uh, digits, handwritten digits of the NIST data set. I can see that the performance, the classification uh, accuracy drops as the angle increases. Yeah? That's for the vanilla case. That's, that's what I've shown you earlier with the red car, maybe you remember. And that's uh, shown here, okay? Now, you can add um, you know, training sets cases of adversarial attacks, like the Panda case. You can add those. That doesn't help, of course. It doesn't make the system more robust against rotations. You can add examples of adversarial, adversarial attacks. It's not really going to help you. If you add examples of rotated images, as our colleague here discussed earlier, it does make the system more robust, obviously. So now it's able to detect uh, cats, for instance, from the different angles, because you have given it many different examples. That's great, but not unexpected. And for our system, you obtain a very similar result. So it's also robust against uh, rotations. Not because we fed it examples of rotated images, but because we 
augmented the model with uh, angles. Okay, so the model knows now, now knows that, okay, I'm seeing a cat with this particular angle. Actually learns about the environment. Now here is something really fascinating. Um, we apply now adversarial attacks to different models. So we apply adversarial attacks to the original CNN, and that is performance without attack. We apply two different adversarial attacks. I won't discuss the details. For one attack, the performance drops to this uh, level, 25%. For one attack, it drops to, to zero percentage, completely fails. So the CNN system is very, very sensitive to adversarial attacks, can be easily hacked. Yeah? If you add in your training set rotated images, of course, it doesn't help. It doesn't help. Same. Actually, it makes it worse, obviously. If you add examples of, of adversarial attacks, it does help a lot, not surprisingly. Huh? So now instead of having this, you have this performance. Instead of having zero, you have now 60%, um, 80 plus percentage. It does improve. That's great. But yeah, not surprisingly, we give examples of, of adversarial attacks. Surprisingly for us, our system is even more robust against adversarial attacks. We never optimize this for adversarial attacks. Maybe it's because we teach the system about the, the universe that we have rotations. It's harder to fool the system. It's harder to design a noise vector to confuse the detector because the noise vector might not be invariant on the rotations. Okay? So by adding physical variables, we can make the system much more robust against adversarial attacks, which is quite useful, I think. I don't fully understand this yet. We will do some more analysis. But that's, I think, promising. So the, I think the bottom line here is that if, the, if you make the system more intelligent by teaching it about the world, it's much harder to make the system fail by the serial attacks, by rotations, and other transformations. Okay? That's something we learned from this experiment. And of course, we have to do more analysis. Yeah? So the system that we developed, that is, again, is more robust against the, the serial attacks. Is great. So in summary, this is the first part. Um, be able to make so the standard systems, deep learning systems can be quite sensitive uh, to the serial attacks and different types of transformations. Uh, to make it more robust, our philosophy, and also philosophy of other team member of other teams in the world, is to um, teach the systems about the physical world by include by including physical variables. And uh, our next step is to follow this program more rigorously of combining statistical methods, statistical signal processing, and machine learning. So you have, in the one world, you have the graphical models, you have, uh, for instance, hidden Markov models, and so on. You have machine learning on the, one, on the other side to bring them both together into a more comprehensive, a more complete uh, framework towards more robust deep learning systems. So that's our research in terms of uh, new technology, new methods applicable to any kind of machine learning problem, which is uh, transportation. Of course, now the question is, uh, what's the impact of such issues on autonomous cars, for instance? Okay. Yes? Um, It does help. It makes the system more robust. You're not hurting it in any way. So, are you referring to rotated cats, for instance? If you add, I'm oh, sorry, rotated uh, images, like uh, here, yeah? It doesn't hurt. It helps. So, why would you think it hurts? It would make it worse. Yeah, it hasn't learned much more. Yeah. You may have to augment your system with more parameters to catch, to um, how do I say, to be able to, to code um, rotations. Because now you have the cat space is now larger, right? So you may have to add more layers and more parameters, more weights into the system to be able to handle all those new cases. That may be an issue. So if you fix the same, if you use the same architecture, maybe it would become worse. I think that's maybe your, your question. Yeah, great. Yeah, now I got it. Thank you.
So I could talk more about this, but I will shift gears. I only have 15 minutes, so I will now move on to something else. So how, does, how can this impact autonomous cars, potentially? So at NTU, we have uh, the Center of Excellence for testing and research of autonomous uh, vehicles. We have actually a few people here from uh, Citroen, a few over there also, Andrea. And uh, I'm part of the center. It's a consortium including NTU, uh, several companies, and also LTE. And our aim is to do research about how we can test autonomous vehicles, also to provide a test track so that companies can come to us and run tests and uh, make progress on their research. Uh, so we have multiple um, objectives. And also we engage with the public. We organize workshops, uh, seminars, and so forth to educate people about uh, autonomous vehicles and their potential impacts on society. So yeah, we have been doing this for more than two years. I can't talk about all technical details. But just a summary. How can we test autonomous cars? Well, at first we just check the design review. We do a design review, we check what are the components, we do a rough check of what's out there. And if that looks sound and, and meaningful, we move on to test the vehicle in simulations and software. So we take a model of the vehicle and we run it through different uh, scenarios and check how it performs on the different scenarios. If that looks all, all right, if it looks fine, we bring the vehicle on the test track, on the physical test track. We conduct tests with the vehicle to do all kinds of uh, measurements. And then, if that's OK, we can bring the vehicle on the actual road and do tests over there. So I have a multi-step uh, uh, procedure to test uh, cars, autonomous vehicles, before we can bring them into the actual world in, in, you know, in Singapore. Uh, so um, I'm personally, and my team is interested in the virtual test and the simulations. And now if you think about what I just talked about, the simulation should also capture failures, noise, errors, errors in perception of vehicles. You can't assume that the vehicle will detect and see the world perfectly. Okay? It may miss particular objects, it may not detect objects, it may have phantom objects, it may think there is a car but there's no car. It may confuse a car with a truck and so on, or a car with a hair dryer, but not. So we have to model such imperfections in the simulations, okay? So just to give you uh, an, an idea, so this is how the test track looks like. If you have interest in visit it, let me know. Uh, and we have a uh, digital twin. So we have the same, but now in simulations, in the software. So we can run virtual tests on the test track in the simulation before we bring the car on the actual track. I can tell you this track is being used all the time. At least 12, 13 companies are using this nonstop to do, to do tests of the new vehicles. So that's uh, really popular. So we have a very hot and very active um, research uh, ecosystem in the field of uh, autonomous cars. That's now happening here in Singapore. And um, so we are, as I mentioned, looking into virtual testing, we as in my team. And so why? Well, it's hard to test the vehicle in the physical space. It's hard to test a car on the highway because you have to block the whole highway for yourself to do the tests. It will be expensive. It can be also dangerous. So it's much uh, cheaper and, and uh, more practical to run simulations first. That's the idea, the benefits. And um, as I mentioned, we have to incorporate the uh, errors. Yes? Oh, great question. I can talk about that uh, an hour by itself. <laughs> In fact, some of the team members here could say much more. Yes, we are using some, I mean, multiple commercial packages. We combine them because there is no package by itself that can cover all the cases and can handle everything. But as I will explain, uh, these commercial packages assume typically that the perception is perfect. So when a drive car, when the car drives through an environment, it will detect all the pedestrians, it will see all the buildings, it will, it will correctly identify all the road signs. In practice, that doesn't happen, of course. So my research, our research is about creating more realistic uh, perception models and outputs. And then see how perception errors impact the behavior of the car. Does it maybe break too late? Does it make the wrong turns? Does it crash into something? That's what we do in our research. So yeah. Uh, the sensors can, um, have, can, have, can have all kinds of uh, errors uh, due to uh, 
reflections, uh, lighting conditions, and um, different uh, reason, re reasons. So it's important to capture those uh, potential challenges for the sensors. Now, some people model the noise in the sensors. Okay, that's hard because you have to model the whole the physics of, uh, for instance, how lidar, the lidar system receives the laser lights. You have to model the reflections on the trees and the buildings and all that. It's quite complicated. What we do is we model errors on the perception level. Okay, so we ignore. The physics, we look immediately at the output of detectors. Does the detector detect pedestrians? How is the bounding box? Is it, uh, is on, is it on the right spots? Is it maybe on the, on the wrong location? I will show you in a minute. So we model errors on the perception level. OK, we just, OK. So um, we use commercial software, which assumes typically that uh, the sensors are perfect. Okay. Let me add perception errors in the simulations. That allows us to see how the car behaves erratically, potentially, because of errors in perception. Of course, if it doesn't detect a pedestrian, it may keep driving and crash into a pedestrian. That's an extreme case, of course. So that's what we want to model and, and explore. So yeah, maybe that's too technical. Excuse me? Yes, yeah, so let me give you one example. Uh, so maybe I will. I will straight go to the picture. So I talked about the bounding box. So this is a scene that is a, a virtual scene, synthetic scene. Imagine that's a person, pedestrian. And ideally, we'd like to have this bounding box. So the system knows there is a pedestrian. Okay, there it is. That's the ground truth. In practice, it's never that clean. Maybe the system detects it like that. It's too large. You see? Then we quantify this error. So the error in the left top corner and right bottom corner. So you have xy for left top, xy for bottom right. That's what we quantify. Okay. So what, what does it mean? If um, the bounding box is too large, the system thinks that actually that, that, that the pedestrian is very close. Okay. If it's a small box, the system thinks that the pedestrian is very far away. Now imagine in this case that the bounding box was small. It would be like this. This small. If you think, oh, it's OK, the pedestrian is far away. It wouldn't break early enough, it may crash into the pedestrian. Okay, that's kind of an example of what can go wrong due to mistakes, errors in perception. So we quantify the error in the bounding box. This is the offset. There are many different errors. Maybe it didn't detect the pedestrian at all. That's something else we don't cover in this in this talk. But in this case, I just look at the offset. So we look at uh, data sets, movies where people have labeled, have annotated the bounding boxes by hand, we run our detector, and we compute this offset here in the top left and bottom right corner. And if you plot such, um, I will skip some things here now. If you plot this, you, look, you have such a curve, like uh, here in blue. That's the offset. It's the top left corner, x coordinate, Y coordinate, bottom right, X coordinate, Y coordinate. So yeah, basically a stochastic signal, it's like a stock, stock index. It's a stochastic signal, and we model that stochastic signal by linear or nonlinear models, and that we then incorporate in our simulations. Okay. So when we run simulations, let me show you an example. Sorry. When we run simulations, yeah, I have to show this. We simulate a noisy. I wish I could show. Yes, okay. We simulate noisy bounding boxes that look like real bounding boxes, I mean, as it is coming from an actual detector. So you see, that the bounding box is moving. Oh, it's not yet moving. Let's try again. And no luck. Well, it was supposed to move. Okay. So we build. Stochastic models that capture errors that are typical for detectors. That we integrate in our simulations. Then we can see how the system uh, behaves differently, stochastically. So, um, thank you. Hopefully, this one will play. So, here is a simulation. Well, it doesn't play. Sorry. So, well, what's happening here? You have the car driving. Then you have one person who is jaywalking. 
and we check how the car stops when the person crosses the street. We do that without noise in the perception, and then with noise. Okay, so this is one of my final graphs. So I show you the distance between the car and the pedestrian who is crossing the street over time. So the blue curve is without any noise. You have perfect perception of the pedestrian. You have the perfect bounding box. That's the blue curve. And if you add noise to the bounding box, you do it here in this case four times. You have different curves. And that's the brake torque. So you see how the brake torque is different for each random sample. Each time you run this, you have a different brake torque. And of course, if the car doesn't brake fast enough, it may crash into the pedestrian. That's how we can actually simulate many such cases and verify the, the, the risk associated with different perception errors. That's the concept. So with that, I will end this part. So we add noise to bounding boxes coming from the cameras and the protection systems. That leads to erroneous behavior of the vehicle. And uh, you can expect actually quite risky and complex environments risky uh, behaviors in more complex environments where you have multiple pedestrians and you have trucks and you have different road users at the same time and then the car might be in, in trouble if it doesn't uh, take care of its perception errors. So in conclusion, we are trying to model imperfections in perception. So far mostly for cameras, we will move that, we will extend this to LiDAR and radar and also different uh, types of errors. And um, a different direction is also to study useful use cases of autonomous cars. Specifically in Singapore, so let me show you one video clip and hopefully this one will play. <laughs> okay. It doesn't, I will try again. Okay, so this is an example of a simulation okay. of an AV uh, in Singapore context. So it's near Amokyo station. Um, yeah, great. So we see the LiDAR signal, so it measures depth. And here you see the depth map. And the environment is actually in Singapore. So we have, we have architects in our team who have drawn in 3D different buildings. So we can simulate uh, use cases specifically for Singapore. I'm thinking of like first mile, last mile mobility, where you pick up people at the HDBs and you bring them to the nearest station by an autonomous vehicle. So we would like to find out whether it's actually feasible with today's technology knowing and modeling all the imperfections of the current technology, as in maybe some mistakes and detections, errors in the bounding boxes. So how does that impact potential use cases of EVs, such as first mile, last mile, such as autonomous buses, which have fixed routes? That's something we are now exploring. We do it very concretely for specific regions in Singapore uh, in collaboration with LTE and other partners. Yes, so the aim here is to verify the feasibility of today's technology. So if people claim that you can use AVs in 2020, 21, in this region of Singapore, and that region of Singapore, we are trying to actually verify this and test this under different conditions. Okay? So of course, there's a lot of work, not done by me, it's done by a whole team. So I'm thankful for the entire team, and some of them are now here. Also thankful for support from the government, National Research Foundation, also quite a few companies, and uh, I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, what challenge, so your, your models could be deployed in the real world. However, they are being trained more robust in the virtual one. 
what challenges do you face when you test the model in the real world being trained in a virtual one? Yeah, of course, the, the virtual world may not capture all the, for instance, uh, weather conditions, like rain or maybe haze or in Europe, uh, snow. It's hard to model such uh, weather conditions uh, without going to the physical details. That's one issue. Also, sometimes people may behave in unexpected ways. So I mentioned jaywalking. I think there are different ways of doing jaywalking, and it's hard to capture all possible weird things that may happen. In fact, uh, sometimes we expect that people will try to game autonomous cars. They'll try to fool them somehow, and you have to uh, anticipate how people can react to autonomous cars. So people behave in all kinds of ways that's hard to maybe anticipate. That's one issue. Uh, graphics, maybe that's a technical issue, but I think it's more about uh, weather conditions, uh, people's behavior, and all that. Yeah. Also, how people drive will depend on the context. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, you would have to anticipate such events. These are kind of the edge cases, and there might be many different cases like that. It's hard to cover them all. So one of the big challenges is to guarantee that you have seen, that you have simulated all possible scenarios. That's almost impossible. I mean, that's a very difficult problem. How do we know that the system has been trained for every possible scenario? They always have, like, freak accidents. You cannot anticipate them. And that's the, one of the biggest questions. Like, how do we make sure that we have covered all possible cases? That's a big problem. Okay. Uh, it's one more question. Last question. Uh, the real-time data. Um, so, let me explain maybe uh, more generally. The question is to make sure that uh, uh, an AV, autonomous vehicle, will be safe when driving in Singapore. Okay, that's the question. Can we guarantee that the given car is going to be safe, uh, going to be reliable uh, when it's driving in the Singapore context? How do, can we verify that? Well, one way is to install cameras, maybe on all the taxis, uh, and then get a lot of data get data about real life scenarios, analyze them, and detect cases that are maybe uh, dangerous for an, for an AV, that are challenging for an AV. That's something that we are trying to do, also other teams. So they try to collect field data in large volumes over long time periods, and then we filter out the challenging cases where an AV may fail. Um, the challenge is to, to get such data, and then also to process all that in an automated way. That's one of the big challenges. So data can be obtained, but that's not easy, not trivial. It can be done by installing cameras on cars and let them drive around in the city. Thank you, Professor Justin, yes. for a very interesting talk about machine learning. So as this is the first graduate colloquium, we would like to have a group picture. Please come towards the stage. We'll have a group picture. Next talk would be on biomedical applications. You know, it's on bioelectronics, biophotonics, and biolasers, where we can use intelligence, neural networks. So please go through the go through your email or the Triple GSC Facebook page where you can find the link for the registration. Join us for the next talk as well. Thank you. Uh -huh. And uh, we are always looking for more students and more postdocs. If you have any interest, let me know. We always have uh, more space for students. Thank you.